Um, well, I guess this is this is a good opportunity for me to ask everyone. Um, how did you find it? Because I've seen it today. I more seen it today. Fringy's seen it today, and so is Little Platoon. So I don't. Lara hasn't seen it, unfortunately, so she can't contribute anything. Um, but I guess it's just a bit of a round table overall assessment of the film. Well, who should go first? You probably. So we'll go like clockwise or something. Wouldn't that be you? Uh, it's fine. No, I, I guess All right, I can go first if you want. That's fine. <laughs> 12 midnight, whatever the clocks do. That's fine. I agree. Okay, so disappointed. I'd actually <laughs> argue a little bit significantly. I was expecting this, if I'm completely honest, to be at least pretty good, uh, if not great. And I got given something that I'm scratching around uh, if I'm getting real, real harsh could be considered bad uh i don't like to say it too too without a lot of arguments backing it because people were like wow seriously but uh unfortunately yeah um i think it's significantly worse than the first two and um it didn't do a hell of a lot of things i think it needed to do to round out the trilogy i was unhappy okay fringy what was your assessment uh, I was also disappointed because I also came into this with uh, higher expectations than I have for basically any other Marvel film in years. I think that the Guardians films are among the stronger uh, MCU entries, um, especially having rewatched them ahead of three. And I would just say that uh, it, Guardians 3 is a much messier film than the other two. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that that seeps through not just plot, but also... Uh, potentially in terms of character. I'm still kind of working on it and figuring out how I feel about it, but yeah, I was uh, I was quite disappointed. Okay. Baggage claim, what did you think? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Platoon, what did you think? Similar. Um, still trying to work some of it out. I'm actually probably going to have to watch it again because it, it, it has the J.J. Abrams effect of everything moving so quickly that it's kind of hard to grasp hold of anything. Um, my over, sort of the overarching feel was they had one story idea for one character in particular, and everyone else was kind of just tacked on out of a sense of obligation. Um, yeah, it's quite formulaic, so the Guardians turn up, they shout at each other a bit, it gets serious, there's a comedic interlude, there's a popular music song, and then you just repeat that. Um, I, I think it will go down probably as as kind of well received because to the extent I've spoken to anyone about it that their question has been yeah but is it better than phase four to which my response is well y y how interesting is that to answer it's it's the lowest of low bars you're not telling me anything about the film by saying that it's not as shit as Ant-Man you can do a bit better than that um <laughs> so it's yeah it's there were some nice moments, but it, it does also play on the heartstrings so overtly with its sort of cutesy creature feature dynamic that it, it is kind of offensive. It's so easy to play on those heartstrings, and it does it so hard that your heartstrings kind of snap, and then you realize that you, you're just watching a huge, bombastic CGI fest with minimal character work. And then the way they ended, they rounded off without any spoilers, um, they just rounded off kind of with a bit of a nothingness, and it was a, yeah, it was just kind of meh. Okay. Um, well, I guess I should go as well. Um, I guess if I was to rank this, I would say it's, uh, it's better than anything that Marvel have produced since Spider-Man No Way Home, mm -hmm. but it's probably the worst of the three Guardians movies. Um, as I think Moller said, it's... Uh, no, sorry, it's Fringy. Um, it was the most um, messy of the movies. Mm. Um, I, I think the, the best aspects of it were the Rocket Raccoon flashbacks. Um, there was some genuine emotional uh, high points to that. Um, so at its best, it was quite heartbreaking stuff. Uh, and it, it, it hit pretty well. It went to some interestingly dark places. It was also weirdly insulated from the rest of the MCU. It felt like it was completely disconnected from everything else going on, which can only be a good thing at this point. Um, at its worst, it was frustrating as fuck and, and uh, so dumb so goofy, so laden with ridiculous slapstick comedy. Like, if you had pulled me out of this movie at the one hour mark and said, Drinker, what did you think of that? I would say, I fucking hate it. This movie was awful. It was so dumb, so stupid. Um, all this, this ridiculous, like, goofy stuff put into it. Hated it. The, the, the um, concluding hour kind of redeemed it a little bit. Um, if, I, if I had to... 
liken it to something I'd say it's a bit like it's a bit like Love and Thunder um, and, and not in the sense of quality right but it, it's like as much as Love and Thunder was Taika Waititi dialed up to 11 this movie is James Gunn dialed up to 11 with all the good and bad that comes to that well, sorry that comes with it there, it's like a competition to see how many fucking licensed songs they could possibly cram into this fucking movie. Like, I get it, James. You really, really like music and you want to, like, fill every scene with as many, like, pop songs from the 80s as you possibly can. Great stuff, man. But, like, sometimes it kind of overshadows the action. It becomes a little bit of obnoxious almost. And, uh, yeah, great. It's great that you put your brother in so many scenes when you, you, you know, you probably don't need to, but like, yeah, he's your brother. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a very uneven film and it's at its best. It's really good at its worst. It's terrible. It, um, it yeah. really fluctuates uh, all over the place. We're going to try and remain spoiler free, right? As yes, best if as we possible. Can. So. I'm I'm fifty fifty on whether this would even be counted as a spoiler. As said it in his review, and I think that it's fair to say it's almost a warning. But Adam Warlock fans, I don't think you're gonna be happy. <laughs> I, uh, what was the fucking point of Warlock? Yeah, in this movie. Oh, there you go. That's what I. <laughs> like, that's gonna yeah. Say. What what purpose does he? He seems like the most like. Oh, you got you got to have him in there. But I don't know how to fit him in the story. Well, figure it out. I, cause I I feel like you could have set him up as a really good antagonist. Oh, he could have been great. But when he when you think about what he does in that first oh that first scene, it's like okay, there could, you could set up rivalries with a bunch of different characters and have a great climactic battle with him, and it would be a, an awesome emotional payoff. And there's nothing. Um, there's I'd nothing to him. That opening scene, drink it, it exemplifies possibly my primary issue with the entire plot rather than characters. Um, it, you know, if I was to section it out that way, uh, I have no idea what the stakes are at any point with anyone's health bars or damage being delivered to anybody. No. I never know. You could have someone's head get blown off, which <laughs> may happen in the <laughs> film, and it may mean nothing at all. It's uh... characters, characters who are who are ostensibly human or have the same amount of sort of resilience as a human body can get pushed, like can get blasted through walls. Grabbed by someone and throw multiple walls made out of like steel or concrete, uh, and just be like, "Ow, that was painful!" And like no lasting effects to it. It's baffling. Um, the it's really like baffling of... ones is when people get shot with very significant energy weapons, and the movie slows down and tragic music plays. And then I fight. thought, yeah, I thought that that's a bold move. What they're going to kill this guy off in this scene? Really? Oh no, they're not. Okay. And then that yeah, happened two or three times. Team, the, the this wound, movie teases a lot. Anymore. This movie teases a lot of deaths and doesn't really deliver. Yeah, I would go as far as saying the film is cowardly when it comes yep. to consequence. Yep. yep. And it's really annoying because I got tricked like a million times. I was like, okay, so I'm getting into the mood now that this is serious. This is no, no, they're fine. Oh, okay, sorry. I, you only I, so many times before it's just like, what? Okay, yeah, I don't. Yeah, all right, I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> like, oh, and dude. I'm trying. I'm trying to do this without spoiling the movie for people, so I'm trying to speak yeah. it as vaguely as I can. But mm. yeah, like this is like the final movie in James Gunn's trilogy, and you kind of thought like, oh, he's gonna kill a few people off. This is a very final movie. This is a goodbye. And it just doesn't feel like it. It feels like they wimped out, and it's almost like the executive st stepped in and said, nah, we want to keep these people around in case we want to do other films in future. Definitely feels like an exec said, that Adam Warlock guy, you got to get him in because we're going to maybe do something more with him in the future. It sounds like an Age of Ultron type situation, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my, my favorite parts of the movie were Rocket's flashbacks. Mm -hmm. I think that that plot line was really well done, and I think it like it was more that you said it. It's like they had a great character arc for his character, and they didn't really know what to do with anyone else, and so there was I great payoff. I think that was platoon, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, platoon. Apologies. Um, but yeah, like they they had some great payoffs there, um, some really big emotional um, you know hits because you know. We're not psychopaths here, so if we see animals getting uh, 
tortured and, and suffering and stuff like we're all going to feel that emotional hit of seeing that um and so it's almost like calculated to tug at the heartstrings to push it up a bit because i don't want this to be too much of a shit show in terms of like we've all pretty much agreed i think that it's much better than a lot of the stuff you get in phase four um yes i really liked for example rocket has been mentioned i really like nebula in the film i really liked uh the villain for the most part i'm not the gonna... villain was it's great I... because the, the decisions that get made by different people at different times that can affect how much i enjoy them overall but i'd still say it was it's probably the best villain in phase four like I, I, I liked he, he's a of, good mad he's a good mad scientist and I feel like he really it's probably a lot of it has come down to the performance of the actor. I thought he did a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I really bought into great. this like the fact that he's emotionally invested in the thing that he's doing. That I appreciated. Uh, he's I not wasn't just so like sure. I mean it might be that I missed this bit. So I thought he was incredibly well performed. Um he had some he had some kind of startlingly good lines and it's a compelling motive except that I wasn't really sure why. And it might be that I just wasn't paying attention or I was too busy focusing on something else while that was happening. Is it, I mean, we can't spoil it, but am I right in thinking that they don't ever really answer the why question of what he's doing? Um, I think <laughs> that, I think it's something that can be inferred in terms of a thematic element, but the problem is that I think the them thematic element is um, muddled. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I want to even say what the thematic element is because, well, Hmm, uh, yeah, I might hold off on that. I uh, Something that <laughs> I found with uh, the high Dude. evolution area, there's almost like a clash between the way that he's characterized, how his plan manifests in terms of like what it looks like in the plot and how it's all managed, and then like trying to pair it with a theme that could be derived from the film. So it's kind of complicated, but I'm, I'm like erring on the side of, I like him, yeah. I like him, um, like as a villain, um, and definitely a little you know, bit of retarded. Yeah. The, 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 see, for for people watching this, like who haven't seen the movie, there's one of the central um, ideas that the film wants to explore is like if you try to perfect society with theoretically the perfect people put into it, um, what do you do when uh, like the same problems that beset our society eventually rear their heads? You know, and that that feels like something that should take up an entire movie by itself like that's a big theme to address and it's just like one tiny facet of this film and so it doesn't get anywhere near enough attention that it deserves absolutely undercooked yeah. it, because uh, it's uh the most like the most robust developed aspect of this film is like rocket um and and then and his is like directly you know tied into to all of that but then because it's like, well, we still need to do stuff for everybody else, right? We still need to be, because, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy is not Rocket Raccoon. Um, and then it struggles in that regard to balance it, even though it is longer than the other two films. Like, the first film was surprisingly um, uh, swift in terms of what it's achieving. It's two hours long. Um, and in that time, it completely develops that core set of characters um so that we understand them clearly they all get sent on arcs that are resolved in that film and then you know they grow as a team um this one struggles more possibly because it has so many characters mm -hmm. um it, it, it's trying to do so many things and it's trying to grapple with so many um so many big ideas and there's mm -hmm. just not enough time to do it and it the, the frustrating thing is it wastes so much fucking time on stupid stuff Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's yeah. a real yeah. there's a real element of busy work to that first hour where yeah. it's like they they rocket gets injured and they have to find a fucking code to so that they can do an operation on him so they go to the the place and they infiltrate and there's a big long sequence where the the production design is like off the wall insane um, but then they they do all that stuff and then they find out that the one piece of crucial information that they need has been taken and it's been put into the head of another guy that they have to go and get. And so mm -hmm. it was completely pointless. It was just, it was like a Mandalorian plot, just wasting <laughs> time, just busy work to keep us invested in something. Yeah, there should have been uh, it, way more character development interactions in those sequences to make them worthwhile. But it really felt like the big focus is on, look how interesting this idea is. It's like a huge building that's constructed of flesh instead of I, mechanics. I, I hate, I, I can't emphasize enough how much I despise that entire sequence. It, I it hate how like, stupid um, it is. I hate how stupid everyone is in it. It's like it came from a completely different movie. Uh, and it's, it's wait, like- Wait, a building made out of flesh? Yeah, it's like so a living. It, yeah, so ima of, uh, imagine you want to. Yeah, so imagine you want to build a space station instead of building it out of steel and, and whatever. Like they just grow it. 
it's biomechanical. And so, like, they, they land on it and it's, like, been on someone's skin where there's, like, pores and hair and stuff sticking out of it. It's, they have to cut um, their way in. It's all, just, it's all just done for comedy. And, like, the, the guards that they have to fight against have got these ridiculous big, like, Michelin Man space suits Yeah, they're on. clearly <laughs> it's all designed to make us, like, laugh at it. And the thing about it is, like, this is a problem James Gunn has, and I'm trying to be nice, okay? But the example I will have to give is Taserface from Guardians of the Galaxy 2, where mm. James Gunn thinks his joke is way funnier than anyone else does. It's like, man, you need to, the like, find someone to tell you. That. It's basically, the... there's a bad guy soldier man who's like, my epic awesome name, all of us badass ravages, my name oh. is going to be Taserface. And they're all like, yeah, whoa, cool. And then Rocket starts laughing at him, saying how stupid and ridiculous that name is. And the joke not only goes on for about, I want to say, like three or four minutes in that sequence, it gets repeated about four times throughout the film. And it's like, what is the joke? That a guy was stupid enough to think Taser Face is a cool name. It's like, that might get you a smile, but like, dude, just come on. Move on. The, 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 yeah. The, yeah, there's there's, there's so much of that. And like, I think one of you guys mentioned it already, like, the, the way they handle character conflict is to, to basically have everyone yelling at each other all the time. Oh like, it's not and, and it's they're doing not their interesting. Well. So it's not even like that they're yelling particularly new information that drives characters along. It's just, well, we know what Drax is. Drax does this thing, so let's have him do this, because that's Drax. It's like, okay, we do know that. We've had several films of that. Um, and, and maybe it would be nice to do that in a way that drives character a bit more than you're doing. It feels like a greatest hits compilation for a, a, lot, a lot of it. It's like, everyone remembers this about Drax. Everyone remembers this about Mantis. So that, let's just bring that happy memory back and do the same thing Actually, again and again and again. I think you're on point with that. There's a bit of flanderization going on because uh, someone might argue, like, a lot of these things are in the first one. Well, so why does that get away with it? But this doesn't. And because I was just thinking about... Even their approach to solving problems, it's very ragtag, rogue, and just, let's just go with it. We'll do it and just see what happens. There's a great moment in the film, and I mean great in a bad way, where, I can say this, not much of a spoiler, a character basically jumps out a window to their death, and they don't have a plan. They just yeah. do it. That's their plan. Yeah. They're just going to jump out, and something will happen, something will work out. And the thing about it is, like... It annoys me that as a team, they've been going for this long. They have this kind of tech. They have monetary support. They've, they just they know everything they've, they've been doing. They've done loads of missions. First movie, they've just been thrown together. And a lot of the situations are very much just, fuck, we're in this now. What do we do? What do we do now? Oh, it's very reactive. But they, even in the third movie, presumably their hundredth mission, they still operate that way, even when they have information. And it's kind of like annoying because um, I feel like they deserve to be written smarter but a lot of the time they're just like, fuck it, let's just go over here and try this. I think you even have like meta lines about it. It's like, you know, uh, don't you realize that place is the place where blah, blah, blah is and we can't just blah, blah, blah. And then Star Lord is like, yeah, we can. It's like, okay. Well, yeah, well, like, it, they're, they're, combined they're, they're... with uh, them forgetting about technology and, and material, like, they, they forget about tools that they have at their disposal that change the film if they use them. So that's pretty annoying. Uh, and, it, you know, yeah. There's there's a lot of like supposedly impregnable like space stations and stuff that like nobody can get into that they just like breeze in like any like the 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 four of us sorry the five of us could probably come up with an idea to get into these places it's so simplistic and everyone who works there is so ridiculously incompetent that it happens again and again you've got gigantic space stations that that should that, that house like the most vital stuff. To the, the the villain's um, master plan, but they've got no defenses. They've got nothing to protect them. They've got uh, yeah, no way of fending off alien warships. All that stuff. It's just it's so dumb and it's so like it, it just feels like it was all very much just contrived for this one particular put the movie. In. Yeah, man. It's just there's so much of that throughout um, I this think, film. Um... It, uh, it reminds me of, so The Suicide Squad is a film that, like, in terms of plot, it's kind of a disaster, but, like, um, character is, is, a, is a really, really saves that film. And I feel like um, this film suffers from a lot of the same problems in terms of, like, really, really jank plotting. Um, and the concern that I have is that the more I think about it, the more I think that those plot problems are going to seep into character. 
that's what's concerning me at the moment as I'm thinking about I, the film. Well, um, I, put it put it in this way: like I didn't particularly like Nebula in this film. I, I felt like she didn't really act like herself. She she was very um, the the old Nebula was kind of quite logical and very calculated about things. This one just seemed like very angry all the time, and it just didn't fit with her as well as as previous incarnations. Finally, and we can disagree on something. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and Gamora, like, just annoyed the hell out of me uh, uh, because there was there's so many scenes where uh, I was just waiting for Peter to to bite back a little bit. Like, there's one particular scene where like she's like uh, ranting and ranting at him and pushing him constantly, saying like, "I just want to be picked up by the Ravagers and I want to be taken out of this." And you know, I. Mission. There's no chance of success. I, I, I'm not want to be part of this. You have to get me out of here. And that would have been an ideal moment for Peter to just be like, "Fuck you, Rocket is our friend. He means the world to me, and I, like I'm going to risk everything to get him back, or I'm going to save him, or whatever." Like that. That's a moment where he needed to stand up for himself, but he wasn't allowed to fucking do it. He just like takes it, and it had to be Nebula who like protects him and stands up for him, and it just felt so fucking irritating. The, the, there was things like that just throughout the movie that, that were just pissing me off about her. So I I'm actually, not... oh, I think Gamora. that Gamora is off character-wise. I don't think, I'd, I'd love to talk to James Gunn about it. I'd be like, why did you think from 2014, right, Guardians of the Galaxy, the girl who basically was the one that convinced the Guardians to do the moral thing, the one that worked with the Nova Corps, the one that left Thanos the moment she realized like the Earth is in trouble, or the, the universe is in trouble, why would that girl team up with the Ravages? I don't understand. And then yeah. why is she such an asshole? Like he, James Gunn's clearly running with like she's she's punished Gamora. And it's like, but why? Why did you yeah. make her punish Gamora? She, she, I don't know, man. Like if Peter's coming to her and saying like, look, I know you don't know me, but like in the future, like the Gamora that I knew, like we fell in love, we had this incredible relationship and stuff. Would she not at least hear out? Like you say, based on the Gamora that we know, and it's the same person, it's the same baseline personality, she'd be at least open to listening to him. But it's like oh. her her entire shtick is like, what? Well, no, we have to press the reset button on their relationship, and she just has to be a dick to him at all times. Some people don't understand. So I'm not talking about us ke keeping the personality traits of the Gamora that went through Guardians 1, Guardians 2, Endgame, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about the, the Gamora we meet in Guardians 1, is the Gamora in this movie plus however many years. Why yeah. would the one that left Thanos, which by the way, when they snatched that Gamora from in Endgame, if you remember, that's the 2014 Gamora. It's, it's not too long before Guardians. In fact, I think it's like around about the same time because they're doing the, they, they're stopping Peter from getting the Power Stone at the same time. So it's, it, it's set right around Guardians. Why would that Gamora join the Ravages? I don't understand. What? Like, why is that Gamora such an asshole? Well, it's just think about, uh, think about the characterization of that Gamora in Endgame, like with the scenes that she had with Nebula, like that confrontation and how she was trying to talk yeah. her out of, you know, to, to do that. It, it's like that confused. Gamora is standoffish, um, but she has that moral core that is driving her in, in the first film. It, it's, the, it's the core that like enables the team to come together, like you said. It's like it's it's almost like he's kind of forgotten like who she was. Or has like made a mistake in terms of assessing that character and where she ought to be. Um, it, it's because it's it's a similar Loki is really frustrating. That show is really frustrating because they forgot that they plucked Loki out at his most yeah. evil, and then they're like, "Well, if we show him a video, we, we can just fast track him to be the Loki that we want him to be." Um, it's like a different problem here, um, of almost like a, a, a another misread of like who that character was at that time. And yeah, so it it just doesn't it didn't read properly to me. And the he kind of puts her not necessarily on an arc, but in this film she is broken down a little bit. By the time you get to the end, she's much more of a closer to the Gamora we're familiar with. But I just don't see how how that happened. I don't know why he went with that. It felt almost um, like a stereotype. Like yep. this one's gonna be angry and an asshole, and that'll that'll <laughs> create a very significant sort of difference in the relationship. And it's like yeah, I know, but you have to justify it. <laughs> 